Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Maya Ghosh, and I'm one of your Ath Fellows this year. Tonight's panel discussion topic needs no introduction. Policing has been one of the most hotly contested issues across the United States, yielding passionate discussion, protest, and policy from all ideologies. The debate surrounding policing yields fundamental questions which strike at the core of the United States' status quo. What should public order and safety look like? Should the police be defunded or abolished or reformed? What about issues of race and policing? Tonight, Alex Vitale and Peter Moskus debate whether the police should be, re be a part of the reimagined public safety strategy in the future. A defender of policing, Moskus is a professor at CUNY John Jay College of Criminal Justice and author of Cop in the Hood. He is the director of John Jay College's NYPD Executive Master's Program and is a former Baltimore City police officer. He has taught introductory criminal justice classes at LaGuardia Community College in Queens and is a senior fellow of the Yale Urban Ethnography Project. He is the founder of the Violence Reduction Project as well. A proponent of abolitionism, Vitali is a professor of sociology at Brooklyn College and author of The End of Policing. Vitali is a professor of sociology and coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project. He has spent the last 25 years writing about policing and consults both police departments and human rights organizations internationally. He is the author of City of Disorder, How the Quality of Life Campaign Transformed New York Politics and the End of Policing. He's also a frequent essayist whose writings have appeared in the New York Times, The Nation, NY Daily News, and USA Today. The debate will be moderated by Professor Michael Fortner, an associate professor of government at CMC. The structure of the debate is as follows. The first 10 minutes will be opening statements, the following 25 minutes will be moderated discussion, and then 20 minutes of audience Q&A. The last 15 minutes are left for closing statements and remarks. This moderated conversation is co-sponsored by the Open Academy and the Dreyer Roundtable at CMC. Before, I be before we begin, I must ask that you respect the AFT's COVID guidelines. Please keep your mask on for the duration of the program indoors. If you'd like to take a sip of water, please leave the Eggert Dining Room to do so. Further, audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Now, please take a moment to silence your cell phones, take a deep breath, and remember to be present in this space. Now please join me in welcoming Professors Moscos, Vitali, and Fortner to the Athenaeum. Good evening. Good evening. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here with two of my former colleagues. Um, I must say that I'm very fortunate to be in the position to moderate this debate, in part because I am profoundly conflicted on this issue. I don't know what the hell I think. And so I hope through the process of this discussion debate, we'll be able to clarify some of the issues. But first, let me tell you why I'm so conflicted. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, in the projects at the height of what they called the crack epidemic. And I had a brother that was murdered in the streets of Brooklyn. He was stabbed to death with an ice pick after a block party. And as I write in my book, the pain of that day stayed with me and in the house like collected dust. It never went away. So I understand profoundly what it feels like to be underprotected. At the same time, I've had several family members cycle in and out of the criminal justice system, seemingly for no reason at all. So I know what it feels like to be over-policed. My mother and father grew up in Jim Crow, Georgia, and she never forgot the terror of standing in front of a white cop in Cairo, Georgia, and knowing that that cop at any moment could take her life or the life of her family members. She understood very clearly from an early age that in Jim Crow, Georgia, that that cop carried all the force 
and power of white supremacy in the town. At the same time, my mother would be the first to call the cops if someone was shooting on the block. My mother would be the first to call the cops if someone upstairs was catching hell from their husband. And so here we have this duality, these contradictions in my life that brings me here. So as we discuss, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what ought we to do in this moment where violence seems to be rising, what ought we to do in this moment when state violence is still a part of the lives of black and brown folk and crushing black and brown bodies? What ought we to do? Fortunately, I have two brilliant colleagues to help us um, clarify the question and to offer some responses. So, Alex, if you please. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And Peter, it's great to see you. We both live in New York, but because of COVID, we've not seen each other in person in, a f in like two, two plus years. So we used to, we both teach at the City University of New York, so uh, we're, we're all have been colleagues together. Okay. So look, if there were no police tomorrow, if they just disappeared, obviously there would be negative consequences from that because we've engineered policing as the central mechanism for producing public safety. And in the absence of any alternative infrastructure, there would undoubtedly be terrible consequences for doing that. And no one that I know who's actually involved in organizing in communities is suggesting that tomorrow there should just be no police. The reality is we have a massive infrastructure of policing that produces a lot of problems, and we're trying to figure out how to reduce that footprint of, footprint of policing in as many ways as we possibly can. Now, at the root of this is a lot of problematic thinking about policing and its utility. And I think we tend to make three core mistakes. First is that we grossly overestimate the actual effectiveness of policing. The reality is, is that the vast majority of serious crimes are never even reported to the police. And of those that are reported, the majority are not solved. The Vera Institute of Justice looked at this and found that in the end, only about 2% of serious crimes result in a conviction. So this idea that it's the police that are out there stopping all the harmful behavior it just turns out not to be true. And only about 5% of police time is directly spent addressing what we think of as serious violent crime, it's violent crime in particular. What are they doing? They're chasing homeless people around the block and they're chasing kids around the block and they're chasing drug dealers around the block and Peter's own work has shown some of the deep futility of some of those kinds of interventions. The other mistake we make is that we fail to calculate the costs of policing. We hear, oh, well, this police intervention produced a 5% reduction in burglaries, therefore, it's all good. We just infinitely expand policing because we have proof that policing works. But we also have to calculate the costs of policing. Police are responsible for between five and 10% of all homicides in the United States. I was looking at the numbers north of here in Bakersfield. A few years ago, the Bakersfield police were responsible for 20% of all homicides in Bakersfield. We have real measures of the harms that intensive policing produce for those who are policed. It, it affects life expectancy, it affects school completion, it, uh, it affects the cohesiveness of communities. These are measurable negative consequences so that even when we say, well, policing works, we have to figure out the other side of the equation. The American Public Health Association a few years ago, not far from here in San Diego, took a firm position that said, policing is a major public health threat and the solution is less policing. 
and investing in public health interventions, community empowerment strategies, and the rest. The third mistake that we make is we fail to calculate in the potential alternatives. What could we do instead of policing? We don't consider that. We just say, policing, does it work or not? And then we leave it at that. But in fact, we have a growing body of research around a wide variety of different kinds of interventions that show there are lots of things that we could do to address very concrete public safety problems that are currently managed by policing. Between a quarter and a half of all people killed by police in the United States are having a mental health crisis. And policing is just the wrong tool to manage that problem. So we need to have a spirit of experimentation we need to m take seriously these interventions. We hear, well, we have an anti-violence program. It gets, we give them $50 million a year. Yes, but we spend $10 billion on policing. Imagine if we reverse those numbers. What kind of investments, what kind of structural changes we could make in local places that would actually make these communities safer and healthier places without the costs of police violence mass incarceration. Thank you. Um, for, go give him a round of applause, come on. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for being here, and um, um, I can't say, because I've never said the initials. How do you, you Claremont McKenna College, what, what's the, uh, but you say C, CMC. CMC, thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank CMC for bringing me here, um, and, and of course to, to Professor Fortner and Professor um, Vitali, it's, it's, it's great to be here, and I'm looking forward to this, to, the, to this debate. Um, I, you know, it's interesting because, in many ways, Alex and I agree on a lot of these things. Uh, we both agree that society needs to better deal with problems of housing, poverty, mental health. The list goes on. Um, we believe strongly in that. Uh, we both, and this might surprise people, share a vision in which there could be a need for less policing. Um, I agree with that. Um, but where we disagree is in A, the fundamental nature of policing, what it stands for, what it does, uh, B, the actual effectiveness of policing in maintaining community standards, uh, in maintaining order, in preventing violent crime, and thereby preventing trauma. And I also think um, we disagree in, in um, the achievability of, of the alternative vision. Um, perhaps I'm more cynical, uh, but I also say there are a lot of issues that, um, well, we'll know the second we can abolish police, when people stop demanding police. Uh, I fear there's a great danger in putting the cart before the horse. Um, we, by all means, experiment. Um, I would disagree somewhat. We spend a lot of money on social services now. New York City and Los Angeles spend more on social services than they do for policing. That's been lost in this debate at all. Somehow if we could well move up, shift a, a million dollars from policing to, to services for the unhoused, we'd solve all their problems. And I don't think it's about money. I think it's about effective policy. That, those aren't my fields, however, mental health care, housing. Um, I leave it to others. Fix it. But we, you know, New York City, we spend $11 billion on social services collectively. We spend a little under $6 billion for policing. The issue there isn't money, I don't think. It's political will and it's law and policy. Um, when it comes to the role of, so I, I would say, I, I, I try to disaggregate those things. That's, that's my point, is let's focus on one or focus on policing, but I don't like tying them together so much. The other fundamental disagreement we have is on the role of policing. Um, Police were invented in the northern industrial model. It comes from 1829 England, moved to New York soon after that. In the southern model, it, it comes from, from slave catchers. Uh, policing reflects society for good and for bad, though the bad part gets is more important because we're paying for a police. But the function that society, I believe, needs to be policed as a verb. If we can set up alternatives to a municipal police department, fine, but municipal police departments were set up because society wasn't doing it. 
And I like to think we are more, we are better a society than we were 150, 200 years ago, without a doubt. Um, perhaps there are alternatives. But that function of police, I say, is a noble one. Flawed, but noble. Um, and we should work to improve it. But if we start with the premise that policing is an inherently evil institution, not that they haven't done evil, if we say that's their purpose, I think we're getting off um, on the wrong, wrong foundation here. The question is, who is going to do the policing? It might be your parents, it might be your religious instructors, it might be the police department. Um, but I would prefer to have that function served by a municipal, somewhat accountable organization that has to follow the Constitution in theory, and often does. But I'm saying at least that's the ideal. Because the alternative are rich people get private security and poor people get gangs. Um, and I don't like either of those choices. It's a public service that policing serves. Um, so let us work with what we have. We're not going to abolish policing. It's unpopular politically. I personally think it would be immoral, but even Professor Vitali, so much to my surprise, says, let's put that on the back burner for now. That's fine. Um, let us deal with these other problems um, and let us focus specifically on, on, on what policing can do and on data and what they do and make them better. It's interesting, um, as you mentioned, Bakersfield. There's some cities in America, and Bakersfield is one of them. Others are Albuquerque, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Salt Lake City, Aurora, Colorado. Um, cops shoot a lot of people there. I don't know those cities. They're all west of the, Missi all west of the Mississippi. St. Louis, too. Um, what are they doing wrong? What are the other cities that shoot fewer people than you might expect based on America's low standard? Um, but see, you know, New York, Detroit, even Baltimore and DC to some extent. Um, we could propagate best practices and try and figure out the right way to do things, or um, we could simply sort of place, po we could fight police, and I don't know to what end that would be. Thanks. Yes, thank you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose a question to one of you and then allow the other one to respond and then we'll go from there. Um, Peter, the first question is for you, and you touched on sort of the history of policing very briefly. So let me read to you something that Marion Kaba, a prison abolitionist, wrote in the New York Times last summer. There is not a single era in United States history in which the police were not a force of violence against black people. Policing in the South emerged from the slave patrols in the 1700s and 1800s that caught and returned runaway slaves. In the North, the first municipal police departments in the mid-1800s helped squash labor strikes and riots against the rich. Everywhere, they have suppressed marginalized populations to protect the status quo. So when you see a police officer pressing his knee into a black man's neck until he dies, that's the logical result of policing in America. When a police officer brutalizes a black person, he is doing what he sees as his job. Peter, as a scholar of policing and as a former cop, how do you respond to those historical claims? I respectfully disagree with a lot of them and different claims. There are a lot of claims in there, by the way. Let me sort of to address the last one first. A cop murdered a man. Um, he was arrested, tried, convicted. Um, at that level, that's how our system works, which isn't very satisfying, but that's the system we have. Um, if you haven't guessed it, I, I'm not a revolutionary. Um, so that will, should come as a surprise to no one. That was, uh, that was our system of accountability. If you want to have a revolution, go right ahead, but there are a lot of people who are going to fight that. Um, as to police history, you know, reasonable people can differ from history. I, I do believe in the concept of an objective truth. I don't think you can see that in a historical concept because there was no single reality back then for different people. Um, policing undoubtedly reflects the political classes that control them. That's why we must control the political classes because police are going to reflect that. A stronger case can be made that police were set up for, uh, from a nativist perspective, anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic. The idea that police were set up for, as a system of white supremacy in the North, this is leaving aside the, the, the slave states for now, I don't think there's any root in historical documentation for that. I think that is a theory that is being applied ex post facto. Um, if policing, as it was established, was established for the purpose of white supremacy. Why wouldn't have Frederick Douglass said anything about cops? 
he was publishing a newspaper in Rochester, New York, when the police department was established there. I went through those papers. I may have missed something. You know, it's hard to prove a negative. But if they're all on the Library of Congress website, I, I encourage you to do it. Um, didn't bother him. If it doesn't bother Frederick Douglass, I kind of think it wasn't a big deal to him. Uh, maybe he thought it would improve public safety. I don't know. Um, he mentioned police occasionally, casually, in relation to crime. Um, he had no opinion on the establishment of policing that he published in, in the 1850s in the, Ro in the Rochester papers. Um, so I argue with that um, idea that, that that is the purpose of police. Um, and again, you know, that's an argument that will continue. But um, was there a, did I miss part of that question? Okay. And then so I have like two, three minutes or something to, okay, so uh, the argument that I make is that policing has been the modern response to managing the consequences of regimes of exploitation. And we see this in the formation of police departments wherever they get created. And the primary mechanisms of exploitation during the period of modern police creation around 200 years ago were colonialism, slavery, and mass industrialization. So Peter mentioned the 1829 formation of the London Metropolitan Police by Sir Robert Peel, Robert, Bob, the Bobbies. And there's always a lot of talk about this model of unarmed policing by consent, the establishment of a rule of law during a period of social upheaval. But what often gets left out of that conversation is where Robert Peel got this idea from. His job prior to that was that he was in charge of the English colonial occupation of Ireland. And during that period, the British military was caught up with Napoleon on the continent, and he needed to develop a new mechanism to manage resistance in the countryside to English occupation. So he creates the Irish Peace Preservation Force which doesn't meet all the definitions of a modern police force as we think about it. It was more of a gendarmerie, semi-military, but he then further refines that for application to England, not as a colonial project and, and not as a racialized project. It was a project of managing the massive inflows of agricultural workers from the English countryside who had been displaced by the enclosures movement that privatized common held lands and was incredibly disruptive for the peasant classes. They come streaming into London looking for work in the new industrial economy and the result of it is social upheaval including crime and unionization and bread riots and policing is used to manage that problem. This doesn't mean that police officers as individuals say, I want to go into policing because I want to beat up black people or I want to beat up workers, but that is the institutional imperative of that police body. And so it characterizes this whole idea that the way we solve our problems is through the mobilization of violence workers. Because that's what distinguishes policing from other forms of government, is that authorization and capacity to utilize violence. And so ultimately my argument is that we can't just get rid of policing, we have to address the systems of exploitation that make policing necessary. But part of how we do that is by pointing out that caustic role that policing has historically played and continues to. Quick follow-up. You, you both very elegantly situated policing within a structural context, but I do want to focus on the last sentence one more time, if you don't mind. When a police officer brutalizes a black person, he's doing what he sees as his job. Now, you both, in many ways, have sort of, again, sort of said policing is going to reflect the power structure, but I do want to, do want to get a sense of what you think on the individual level when the cop shows up to work, is he thinking that his job is to perpetuate the system of racial inequality, the way Marion Kava suggested here? Yeah, I'm wondering, I don't th know that how much we've talked about like implicit bias training, but one of the main responses we hear 
to dis racialize disparities in the outcomes of policing as well, we'll give police implicit bias training. And this implies that the racial disparities are the result of unintentional and unconscious decision-making processes that affect police discretionary decision-making. And I think this is just ridiculous. It's, it's, it's insulting to our intelligence, and, and most police officers that I've I spoken to- I concur on this, by the way, so I won't, yeah, we actually most agree on this. Most police officers find it insulting to their intelligence, too. So we have a problem, first of all, of explicit racism in American policing. Right, we s constantly find the chat boards and the emails and the Facebook pages, but I also don't think that that is how we should think about the problem overall because policing is increasingly diverse in many big city departments. The majority of officers are non-white, including the LAPD and the NYPD and, you know, there's that institutional racism within the body but the, for me, the bigger problem is a problem of structural racism, which is the decision to turn the problems of black and brown communities into problems of crime to be suppressed by violence workers. So that in, in nicer, wealthier neighborhoods, their safety is derived from their ability to obtain stable housing, health care, employment, you know, not because there's a police officer on every street corner. So why can't we all live in communities like that? Okay, did you want to chime in? Um, yeah, this is a weird defense of, of some police violence and horrible crimes that have happened and will continue to happen. There'll, there'll be another bad police-involved shooting next month, just statistically, it's gonna happen. Um, police shoot white people too. Um, that's a bad defense for cops, I know. But it does need to be out there. Um, for um, they don't tend to, th without the racial angle, they don't tend to, to, to gain national prominence. I wish they would a little bit, because I don't, um, the idea that cops go out, however that was phrased before, um, <laughs> strikes me as, as a little bit absurd and a little bit classist. Um, you gotta know more cops. No, of course, cops, they're, they're, they're going to work. They wanna get their eight hours and go home. Um, the idea that, there's some great conspiracy among a large class of, of state employees. It, 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 it's a being overthought. Um, the idea is to make cops do less bad, less bad things, to have them screw up less. In as much as they're, yeah, I agree, as Alex said, um, the problem isn't implicit racism, it's explicit racism, um, which, I wouldn't, well, it is easier to identify, because in theory at least. Um, that's what we, we should be focusing on. Yeah, the racist cops out there. This is America, it reflects America. Um, and it also reflects the community those cops come from and they, wor and they work in. Sometimes those overlap, sometimes they don't. That's a, that's, a, that's a different problem. But the idea that we have to, I mean, I, when I hear talk about, you know, neoliberal colonial imperialism and, and then the problems of capitalism that Alex thinks create these problems, I don't know, I, I don't have a strong opinion on that. Um, again, I'm trying to focus on the here and now. To talk about the, 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 the theoretical framework, I think, ignores the individual trauma that is happening now. When shootings doubled last year in many cities, when murders went up nearly 30%, the largest increase ever in American history, it's real people, real blood being shed. And you don't even have to be the victim of a shooting to be traumatized. You just have to have a gun pointed at you. You have to be near that. Um, I don't think we're going to fix these other problems in society without fixing first the problem of violence. If you grow up in the neighborhood I policed in Baltimore briefly, and keep in mind, I was a cop briefly 20 years ago. Um, I got a PhD and I've been a professor since, but you police one day and suddenly <laughs> you're a cop forever. Um, but, I, but I was a police officer in Baltimore City. Um, if you're born there, a man in East Baltimore has about a 13% chance of being murdered in his lifetime. It is hard to comprehend that figure. If you grew up in East Baltimore, you can't imagine not knowing somebody that was murdered. For most Americans, I would say it's hard to imagine knowing someone who has been. Um, that, is the Ameri that is segregation in America. Um, but if you have that level of violence, where there is a greater than one in chance you're gonna be murdered, 
and you know, that means by the age of like 35 or 42, if you can get past that age, it, it, you're, you have a good chance of dying of natural causes. Um, I don't know how we can f fix America with that. It, we, can, we can push that aside. People won't even go to those neighborhoods. The people from those neighborhoods largely don't have voice. Um, we have to give uh, those people voice and hear that, but, but it is, the trauma is immense. And so when I hear economic theory, I, I, I think it misses the picture of, of, of the here and now. Alex, on this point, um, violence is real in terms of state violence, but also in terms of interpersonal violence. And you spoke very eloquently about the negative consequences of policing, um, but there, there are also extreme social costs to violence. What do you think are viable alternatives to policing that will deal with violence and its costs? So, first of all, violence is not one thing, right? It, it includes state governments agreeing to poison the water supply of entire communities, the violence of poverty, the violence of homelessness. And many of those forms of violence are more deadly and traumatizing to those communities than interpersonal shootings and that sort of thing. But I'm not trying to define away the question, but I do want to put it into perspective, what we consider to be a crime problem to be addressed by policing and what we don't. Because we, there's a lot of violence that's not getting addressed. On what we conventionally think of as interpersonal violence, we need to have interventions at different levels tailored to the different types of violence we're talking about. The factors that might drive, for instance, intimate partner violence might be completely different than the factors that are driving violence between young people in beefing public housing developments or the violence that drives, you know, um, organized drug dealing and battles over turf. So we need to develop strategies that address those specifically. So, and we need to do that both in short-term acute ways and while we work on longer-term structural interventions. And we have mechanisms that are available to do that. We can look at things like identifying high-risk individuals for involvement in violence. And, and one of the things we know is that the risk of being a victim and an offender is often about the same. And in fact, m most offenders tend to have previously been victims. We need to look at cure violence interventions. We need to look at advanced peace type violent, uh, violence intervention programs. We need to look at school completion. We need to look at a whole host of factors. And there are a lot of communities doing this but we need to significantly increase those investments and be open to more experimentation about that. While we work on the fact that violence in the US is incredibly concentrated in a very small number of places with long-term entrenched racialized poverty. And that should never be forgotten in this conversation. What's the evidence um, to suggest that many of those experimental programs can be scaled up in cities to serve in the long term as a viable alternative to policing? Well, we don't know because no one has given us the money to try it, right? So again, we spend $50 million on all forms of like violence intervention programs in New York City and we spend between six and $10 billion on policing. So let's try to first do it. Let's try to scale it up and see where we're at. We have plenty of examples of programs that have shown very positive results. Advanced Peace here in California, in Sacramento and Richmond has shown very positive results. And we now have five pilot programs ramping up in New York, but each of the pilot programs is getting $200,000 for the largest city in the country. So it's not adequate to meet the need. A lot of these programs have been running for a long time. Uh, we don't hear about their su success because they're probably not succeeding. Um, if they were, you would hear about it. Um, 
the programs are hard to scale a lot. Of, I mean, I'm not thinking specifically about violence interrupter programs. Um, there have been also. Can you explain what violence interrupter programs are for the audience? Yeah, it's um, people often with, with criminal records and backgrounds in the game um, meant to talk to people who are prone to violence, specifically, I think, with a focus on preventing retaliation. Um, is that a decent short summary, I think? Um, the, the, it's very much dependent on the individual. That's why it's hard to scale. Um, it's very hard to judge success, which is also true for policing, by the way. It's very hard to count a, a, a murder prevented. But there have been studies, and they show limited success, if any. There are other problems of loss of the violence interrupters being involved and in not having gone straight yet. Baltimore has had many problems. That's been one of them with their programs. That doesn't mean it's fatally flawed, just as you know, corrupt cops, I wouldn't say get rid of the whole department. But it's tough, because you've got an at-risk group in this job. A lot of it, though, there's, I, I, I think there's some belief. Call it the Bagger Vance sy uh, syndrome. Spike Lee had another term for it, that there's some magical person who somehow has the credibility because he's, what, he's done time in prison? Well, so have the, so have the younger people. Um, oh, he's, he's got the magic de-escalation dap? What, 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 what's the special sauce here? What's the, what's the magic powder? Um, now, some may, it may, again, be at an individual level, but um, quite frankly, I, I think there's a, there's a real connection problem. Why is this person going to listen to Pops in the first place? Um, what's he got that I need to hear? Um, and it makes it very hard to, to, to scale up. What's the magic sauce? Um, for policing, I want to go to part of uh, um, Alex's comment, right? That that um, part of the problem with the conversation is. People can I say one quick sure. thing? That said, I'm not against these programs. I want to try it all, <laughs> um, but no, no, okay, that's all. Magic sauce. Um, so, but the the point. One of the points that Alex uh, made was that the conversation tends to assume that police are actually effective at doing the things that we want them to do when it comes to violence and, and crime prevention. So wh what's the magic sauce for them? Like, what's your defense of their ability to actually achieve the goals of policing? Well, there, I hear constantly, time and time again, well, police don't prevent crime. And you know, it goes back to David Bailey and Michael Tonnery and Peter Manning even. Um, and Alex still says it today and writes it in the book. You quote David Bailey. I saw that last night when I was reading your book. This goes, um, we know policing can't prevent crime. If we want to reduce crime, uh, it'll be because we fix society. Um, I was reading this in grad school in 1995 when the murder rate in New York had just dropped about 30% or so. Um, I said, wow, clearly they're wrong because society isn't getting fixed and violent, violence is plummeting. It's kind of why I got into this field. Um, there's a, there's, there, there are dozens of academic studies showing the effectiveness of police presence and police actions in relation to violence prevention. Uh, they're quite clever sometimes related to you know, terrorism alerts in Washington. Cops weren't even doing anything. They were just there and robbery, and robbery went down. There's a clever study going back to 1830 London because we don't know what the crime rate was. Uh, somebody looked at burglary trials using that as a proxy measure for, for burglaries. Good guess. And, and burglaries went down 30% after police were established. That's, that's a good deal. Um, there are many studies showing various forms of policing work. Um, and again, when New York, which led the crime decline back then, what many people don't know is poverty increased in New York City from 1990 to 2000. That's not good, but clearly it wasn't an obstacle to cutting murders by 50, 60% during that time. Um, I'm stealing a line from Thomas Apt. Uh, which is, if you want to focus on violence, focus on violence. Uh, look, at, look at the proximate cause of violence. Um, by all means, if, if it's your interest, focus on these other issues, and I think they need to be focused on. But we can reduce violence in the short term without fixing society. And policing have been shown time and time again, they need good leadership as well, and that's hard to scale, uh, but they've been shown time and time again to, to be able to do so. Well, it's certainly true, uh, as uh, Zimmering pointed out, right, that the crime drop happened without significant improver, improvements in, in short-term measures of unemployment or poverty, and, and that's definitely true. But that's not the same as saying that the results were because of policing. In that case, yeah. Sorry, that it was the, yeah, that's much better, that it's the result of policing. So 
I don't actually think there are so many studies that show this. You mentioned the terrorism study in DC. That showed that it had no effect on violence. It had a small effect on burglary. And crime. And they, but they tested specifically for violence and they found it had no effect. And it had no effect for other crime categories as well. And so we get a few studies that show a small effect and lots of studies that have shown no effect. And then we still have the problem of the complete refusal to calculate costs or consider the potential value of alternatives. So I don't consider this a settled matter the way some of my academic colleagues do. I think there are a lot of problems with these studies, mostly conducted by people who know very little about policing or the communities that are experiencing these crime problems. They're, they're performed by economists who understand complex mathematical modeling and are mostly correlation shopping, in my view. So I like dig on economists. Right on, man. <laughs> um, yes, we all hate economists. Um, so, 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 so uh, P Peter has expressed some support for experimenting with sort of non-law enforcement strategies to deal with the, 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 the problem of policing that we face. Are you opposed to experimenting with different types of police reforms to see if we can minimize um, the level of, of, of state violence that we experience? So uh, that's a great question because I think that, um, I think there is the potential for police reforms to reduce some of the harms of policing. Uh, you know, in the 1970s, New York City made a concerted decision to reduce discharges of firearms by police officers. And they investigated. Could I throw in some data? Because I yeah. know what I think off the top of my head. In 19, off the top of my head. In 1970, the NYPD shot 360 people. Um, or something very close to that. And that's not including the self-inflicted gunshot wounds, of um, which there were several There were over... Well. Cops were shooting their guns off uh, many times a day. They were missing a lot of the time. Um, it's hard to comprehend that level of, of shootings today. Yeah. Yeah, f now, in New York City, cops shoot, depending on the year, but around a dozen people. I think last yeah. year was a bit higher. But so. so I'm not saying that it's impossible to do something. I don't, think it's imp I don't think it's possible to produce those kinds of results all the time by every, you know, and most of the interventions from community policing to body cameras to implicit bias training have not shown, at least in my view, significant or really meaningful improvements. And we plowed hundreds of millions of dollars into these reforms. My view is that elected officials, police leaders, that's what's on the top of their agenda. Our agenda should be pushing for investments in communities to produce safety without the consequences of policing. And let the people who have power and resources, they're gonna do what they wanna do. We need to ask for what we really want because they're never gonna put that on the top of the agenda. So we're going to open it up in a second to questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please begin to stand up at one, one of the mics. Um, but as people are coming to the mics with their question, uh, Peter, what are the best methods for reducing or minimizing police brutality? Um, what do you think about the future of police reform? I. I like reform if it changes things for the better. Both Alex and I have a surprisingly a negative view of reform as a concept. It's perhaps a bit of a red herring and a distraction technique. Um, the ways, well there are a couple of ways. First of all, which is the way we're going, is you could simply reduce proactive policing. If police interact with fewer people and police um, arrest fewer people um, and police stop fewer people, you're gonna reduce the number of people police shoot. Um, by and large, there are three semi-independent variables that, that, that go into the number of people that cops shoot. One is interactions, just the sheer number. Um, the other is levels of community violence, um, certainly impacts police violence, because cops are more, if the more gun, illegal guns out there, the more cops are gonna shoot people. And the third then is the one we can 
uh, well, we can change the first one too. I think that would be bad. But the third are differences between police departments. Um, the lessons are, I, I don't have all the answers, and the lessons are technical. Again, I want to know what the good, I'm you know, not an expert in tactics. But it is about recruitment, tactics, and training. It is a little bit about police philosophy. Um, it might be about two-person patrol, which of course would almost double the cost of policing. Uh, so, but the point is we can, we can change things. Um, needless to say, it's complicated, uh, but yeah, it's, it's the nitty gritty. Recruitment, training, uh, supervision is a big one. Um, and, then, and then philosophy. Okay. Um, thank you both so much for this. I'm here on behalf of the Claremont College's Prison Abolition Collective. Um, my question is for Dr. Moskos. Um, my question is, how do you defend the nature and the institution of policing, even kind of a reimagined policing, to serve and protect, given Supreme Court cases such as DeShaney v. Winnebago and Castle Rock v. Gonzalez, which both ruled and held up the precedent that police have no constitutional duty to serve and protect the people? So even if you say that police have to follow the Constitution, what does this matter? The don't let me off on the first part of that, but let me do the last part last. Um, by having to follow the Constitution, I mean standards of stopping and searching that, that private security um, doesn't have. Uh, by having to due process um, the constitutional amendments. So I, I, wanna, I want those to be agents of the government so that they are restricted by the Constitution. Um, but the, fir the, the first part, I, you know, this is a bit hokey, uh, but it's because to be a sworn law enforcement officer, you have to take an oath, an oath to defend the laws and constitution of your state and the US Constitution. I'm not gonna pretend that all cops do that, but again, it's an ideal um, that a lot of cops take seriously. I think more than you might believe. Um, and the, even cops who take it seriously may not s always succeed in doing that. Um, but that idea that I'm proud to have taken an oath to defend the U.S. Constitution, honestly. I mean, when, when else will I, I get that chance? I guess I could do it any time I want, but, but as part of my job. Um, it matters. So the Supreme Court only looks, yeah, and the Supreme Court has been strangely more pro-cop than cops seem to want to realize. Um, no, it's not, they don't, it's not just the limits they place. It's also the limits of state constitution, of city departments, of local and state law. They, they all come into play. But I do just want to give a little, you know, it's very unfashionable to say, to talk about oaths as, as, as being a good thing, but I, I do think that is part of the institutional ethos of, of policing. Thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, Professor Vitali, you talked about how uh, it's difficult, how, how you want to determine the costs and benefits of policing when you're making a decision about whether to move forward with the police or move towards a world without police. But Dr. Moskos also talked about how it's difficult to measure the costs and benefits of policing. How do both of you understand how we should go about measuring both the costs and the benefits of policing when it's so difficult to do? Okay, well, I don't know that we can get a comprehensive answer to that, because I think there is a lot that's in the weeds about that. I tried to lay out a few principles here, right, which is that, uh, and we didn't talk, I actually didn't get a chance to talk about the financial costs, which is the most obvious one, and that's sort of why I use my time to skip it. Uh, so my view is that we should have some principles that guide our decision making about this. First, we want interventions that are effective. And effectiveness should be measured in terms of increasing public safety, which is not just a question of reducing violence. It can be a whole broad range of measures about public safety. The second is that we should do things efficiently. Right? This is taxpayer money that we're talking about here, so costs matter in this regard. And third is that we should do things in a way that is the most humanely possible, that is the most respectful of people's individual human rights. 
So those are the metrics to consider, and it's my view that policing doesn't measure up very well when we consider those as the core values to be evaluated. Actually, can I, before you go on, I mean, to what extent are we dealing with dueling empirical observations, and to what extent are we dealing with different values and philosophies and approaches to the issue? I mean, is there any bit of evidence, right, that would convince you that police could be a part of our future? Is there any bit of evidence that would convince you to give up on police and policing? So, in my book, I never say there could that there's no possible future that includes police. I don't actually say that. I talk in the new edition of, of the book about what I mean about abolition, which is a set of organizing principles for thinking about how we solve problems as a society. But it is possible, right, that in a complex society, we're going to need some ability to mobilize coercion. But it, that is not what my view, in my view, 75, 85, 90 percent of policing is right now in the United States. Right? And if we look concretely at what police actually do all day, it is not finding serial killers and pedophiles. It is harassing homeless people, arresting kids for being disruptive in school, low-level marijuana arrests, and no matter how lawful, procedurally proper, or unbiased those marijuana arrests are, they are unjust. They're gonna ruin some young person's life for no good reason. And no amount of police professionalization is gonna fix that, in my view. That is a larger problem with our legal structures, and we need political accountability as much or more as we need police accountability. Um, the, the more you talk, Al, because less you could seem to want to abolish police. I want, um, I mean, I agree. We, laws should make sense. That's not a police issue. That's a society issue. I mean, both of us, I don't know, maybe you two, Mike, I don't know, we, you know, we want, want to Don't legalize, put me in this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, want to legalize, uh, uh, legalize drugs. So I want to legalize them to regulate them perhaps more than you do. What it would take for me to um, uh, change my core beliefs is, is just show me a counterexample that works. Um, I was... I didn't think they would work. I was hoping some of the police-free zones in the summer would work. They quickly broke down in very predictable ways. I had, I had no faith in those at all. Um, well, I mean, show me something that works, and then we can get rid of police. That, that's all it takes. Um, I'm, uh, the other, the first, oh, about weighing the effectiveness. I want to make sure that, that not just police and people who are at the focus of police attention, often criminals, not always, um, we're missing a key part, which is are, are their neighbors, the other people, the people who live on the same block. People who live on streets without violence have an expectation of public safety. Everyone deserves that public expectation. Sometimes what police do is not in the best interests of the person they arrest, and it may hurt, harm their life chances. Um, but the other people on that block also deserve to be in that equation. And, you know, poll after poll shows that black Americans want more policing more than white Americans. Um, more and better policing, by the way. It's, it's not that, you know, it's a nuance that shouldn't be that complicated. But, but to sort of impose abolition on other communities, I think, is, 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 is problematic at best. Um, people who live in a community should have a great say in how they're policed. Um, but I want to make sure that that say goes to everyone in the community and not, not simply those um, who, who interact with police a lot. You know, but that polling also shows that when you ask people, do you think we should be spending more money on mental health, school counselors, and that we could reduce the role of policing in conjunction with that, that's also very popular. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm also with the 5C Prison Abolition Collective. Um, thank you both so much for your time. Uh, so we talked earlier about how crimes and shootings went up. Um, however, there was an increase in police budgets in cities like Los Angeles at the same time. So how do we reckon those figures and how can we argue that policing is necessary when the evidence is clear that policing does not reduce crime? 
I really don't want to say that there's a correlation is a causation or anything like that, but also I really can't say that policing is working when we're seeing people be traumatized and harmed every single day when alternatives are available. So I'm just wondering, like we're seeing all these alternatives and we're using policing to enforce them. So why do we assume that we should continue to use policing in these scenarios when social services and alternatives should be used instead? Because policing works and social services isn't right now is my, my short, somewhat overly glib answer. Um, but you know, if you go to, I recently interviewed the journalist Herman Lopez who wrote an article about Vox looking at the evidence of policing and crime. He writes a decent summary of that. Um, you can Google that if you wish. Um, but you no, know, the evidence, I, I strongly, there's the idea that we know policing doesn't reduce crime, like that's, that's I, I guess, as politely as I can, I just want to say that's wrong. Um, that doesn't mean that it always is. It depends on what, what, what police do. Um, and again, I feel we're sort of always moving. I'm not against these other programs. Um, but it doesn't have to come at the expense of, of policing. Well, you know, Alec Carrick at Sanus at, at the Civil Rights Corps has oh, written he hates a pretty, cops. <laughs> he's written a pretty deep critique of, of Lopez's writing on this subject as well as some others. So I don't, I think there's a lot of room for debate here. I think maybe part of this question is about. Wait, so you think there's no evidence out there? That I don't say there's no evidence. I said there's certainly we have some studies that show, you know, if we flood a neighborhood with. Right police, we might get a 5% reduction in this and that, but typically those studies also show that in lots of other crime categories it had no effect. And these effects are very small and typically not super long lasting. But also, I'm not saying that if we had no police tomorrow that police don't play a broad protective function. Obviously they do. We, we, we would be in big trouble if we just flip some magical switch that doesn't exist, right? The, I think, when I think about the situation here in Los Angeles, right, the question to ask in my mind is why are certain political constellations of power so committed to policing in the face of very clear articulated demands to shift resources into other interventions? And I think that's where this issue of political accountability comes in. The reality is, is that these politicians have unleashed a set of economic forces around free markets and subsidizing the already most successful economic actors, and this has not produced broad economic prosperity. This has produced mass homelessness, mass untreated mental health and substance abuse problems, failed schools, economic precarity that drives black market activity, and then they tell us the solution to those problems is more police, because it's cheaper and it doesn't challenge these free market and subsidize the rich ideologies, and then they unleash that violence on the already most vulnerable people in our society instead of providing them housing, medical care, and income supports. And this is my problem with a lot of the social services. I agree, a lot of them don't work. Forrest Stewart's excellent book about down and out and under arrest here in Skid Row shows how those social services are not meant to solve anyone's problems except people who want homeless people out of sight. They're, they never get the things that would actually solve their problems. They never get housing. They never get stable incomes. They never get stable access to health care. What they get is a bunch of neoliberal individual responsibility pandering that makes the providers of the services rich and never actually solves anyone's homelessness. So why can't we re-envision that? I'm serious. I mean, I, I agree. Well, because these elected officials are making their downtown real estate deals at the expense of the rest of us. I want to also... Uh, I'm sorry, do ever is going away. I want to address the funding issue more specifically. You don't have to stay for it, but you may. Um, I, I, I want to address that funding issue. Um, generally, it depends on the jurisdiction. Law enforcement takes about five, give or take, five, six percent of spending in a city. If you count city, count, total money spent by a city, county, and state, police can be three to six percent, depending on where you are. It's not a huge chunk. It's less than education, it's less than social services. 
Now, I want to fund, I want to find programs that work and fund them. They don't have to come from the 5% of the budget that goes to policing. They could. We could also raise taxes. Um, I'm for that. Um, so when I hear people talk about we have to fund these other things, that's great again. But it's always rooted in this abolish police framework that I think is counterproductive. If you give police more money, there's just like, you can make this analogy with schools. If you give schools more money, it, things might get better. They might not. It could just be a boondoggle for, for whatever. Um, that absolutely goes true for policing. You need leadership and accountability to make sure that money is well spent. You have to keep track of it. Um, but when you cut money to policing, as happened in many cities, and then try and reinstate it, you've, 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 broken, you've broken the system. Labor, this is true a lot for schools, it's true a lot for, not for colleges so much, but for high schools, it's true for transit, um, and it's true for policing. Eight, roughly 80% of the budget goes to labor. So when you cut 10%, especially if you don't talk to the organization you're cutting from, um, you're basically cutting half of everything else. All the training and programs and all the things that I support, uh, even more than Alex supports less, but everything else gets cut because you can't fire the cops because of civil protection and unions and so on. So then when you put that money back, you're not back at square one. You've created, you've damaged the system. Um, if you want to cut police budgets, and you, you know what, it's up for debate. Uh, I think on the West Coast, they should pro generally they should be raised. On the East Coast, maybe cut. Um, we spend a lot more in policing and more cops on the East Coast. Again, reasonable people can differ. I don't think there's a magic number. Then get together with the organization and say, we're going to make a five-year plan to cut your budget X percent. Figure out how we can do it with the least pain and the least, you know. That's one way to do it. But simply to say we're cutting your money vindictively because we don't like you which is what happened in a few cities last year. Um, it, it, it decimated police departments. And we're, I think we, and, and partly that's seen, that's seen in, in increased violence. But um, no, I don't think more money is, is, is the answer. I take better leadership with the same money than more money kind of thrown at the problem. All right, so we're gonna have closing statements now. Alex, you wanna start? I, okay, sure. Um, <laughs> I thought we already. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Look, I take what, more questions. Right, what is there to add at this point? So, the officers who were involved in the killing of George Floyd had had implicit bias training, de-escalation training, mindfulness training, were wearing body cameras, were operating under a new, more restrictive use of force policy, were operating under a new policy that required that officers intervene if they saw misconduct by a fellow officer, were operating under a new policy to identify officers at risk for misconduct, like Chauvin, and none of it made any difference. And every time the police do something obviously outrageous, our elected leaders, and police leaders trot out the same tired reforms to try to convince us that they're doing something about the problem. But they're not, because they're committed to using police to address a whole set of social problems that they themselves helped create. Police serve a function for them, and that is why they love them. And we have to break that relationship. We have to demand real solutions to community problems that are not rooted in the mobilization of violence workers. And we do that one step at a time. We get them out of the schools. We hire counselors. We hire support workers. We hire teachers' aides. We create restorative justice programs. We get them out of the mental health business. And we create community response, we create crisis response units, we create a community-based mental health infrastructure, we get them out of the drug business, which is a complete disaster. We get them out of the sex work business. We abolish the vice units. We could do that tomorrow with very little harm, I think, right? Other things, we need to build infrastructures. If we're concerned about the welfare of men and women who become involved in sex work, why, are we, why do we not have universal access to high quality teenage 
shelters for runaways, real housing for these young people. So all these folks who want to prohibit sex work in one form or another, where are they on the front lines of demanding teenage runaway housing for anyone who needs it? But we never see them there because it's a moral issue tied up in a whole lot of free market nonsense. So we're not talking about tomorrow there are no police. We're talking about a new vision for creating a more just society. And we don't have to wait forever. There are steps we can take now. There's creating a new logic of care, of compassion, of solidarity, rather than continuing to rely on an ethic of control and coercion and death. I, I still feel that Alex would pull the bait and switch by writing a book about social reform and using a police, uh, a abolish police as a, as a hook to get people interested in it. I, I don't see the, 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 the connection between these, um, or if I do see it, it I think it's too um, theoretical to, to matter in the real world. Um, all these social services that I support, I'm not against any of that except for that last part about police being agents of mobilized violence as their primary purpose. Um, and even then, I, not, I understand that <laughs> there's a grain of truth in that. Uh, police are there for the, to, because they can use force or at least the threat of force. Um, I think that's actually important to remember. Uh, this is, goes back to Egon Bittner's writing in the 60s and 70s. That's how he defined policing as, as the capacity to use force. A few other people can, parents, uh, schools, and uh, doctors can, can use force, but they don't define their role by it. Um, I think we should be honest about that, uh, that, that function. And so therefore not shocked when it happens. Yeah, we, we do have police force to, 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 to be the stick. Doesn't mean that they have to use it though, and that's the key part. The idea is that the police will be there to enforce community standards. All the talk about helping people, which I, I really don't wanna push to the side, does ignore the fact that sometimes people don't want help. There are some bad people out there who for whatever reason um, do bad things, whether it's school shootings, pedophilia, um, domestic violence, um, everything is not gonna be cured by wraparound services. Then what? Um, that's part of the reason we have police, is because there's some people out there actually trying to hurt people for reasons we can't fully comprehend. Now Alex is saying he doesn't want to abolish police, he just wants to fix society, it's fine. But I think many people in this room might say, oh, we know we can abolish police. No, but we can't, we shouldn't. Um, we can change them. We have to make sure the police are accountable to voters, to morality. We have to make sure that policing is effective, that it's lawful, and that it's moral. It's gotta pass those three tests. It doesn't always pass those tests, by the way. Um, but when it does pass those tests, then we have to say, yes, um, policing does reflect us. We do reflect, reflect policing, and this goes back to the original uh, concept of policing that very much came, when, when policing came to America, it was labeled, this was called the new police. It was meant to be a break from the past, not an evolution. Didn't always live up to that ideal, as I said, but that ideal of uh, policing as a noble cause, yeah, take it with a grain of salt, um, but come up with better alternatives, and in the meantime, let's try to make policing um, the best we can. Please, yes. Please join me in thanking um, my dear friends, Alex Vitale and Peter Moscos for a fascinating and extremely thoughtful discussion, not necessarily a debate. Thank you. You're the best host. <laughs> um, and with that, I would like to thank uh, the Salvatore Center for sponsoring this, the Dry Roundtable. The Dry Roundtable is committed to having more of these conversations. In the future, we'll have a debate um, about the Electoral College. So stay tuned. Until then, good night and be well. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>